All right, we're going to continue on making prototypes today. Um, I love grading the stuff that you guys turned in. You guys did a great job on the assignments I graded in. I said I was behind, and then I graded and caught up with everything in your class. But other classes, I haven't done that yet. So uh, I'm glad I, I warned you uh, about that. But anyhow, it's some great stuff. If you haven't turned stuff in, uh, you know, it's not too late. But, and again, I don't mind late assignments, especially for people that are here and I, I see are working on stuff and all that. But just know that, you know, it tends to be a vicious cycle. If you're a little late on this assignment, that's going to push back when you can start the next assignment and so on. So if you're late, if you're not up to date, you might want to talk to me to talk about, like, what, what needs to happen to get you back on track. All right? So... Um, consider that. All right, let's look at where we left off. And in this section of class, I'm, I'm both talking about how to make a prototype and then how to clone it to make your website and all that, as well as learning some different CSS stuff. So it kind of has a dual purpose. So we did more in CSS, and we'll continue to do more throughout the um, throughout this discussion. One thing that we talked about a little bit is we talked about making your site look good on a mobile device. We'll have a whole unit on that, so I don't want to spend too much time talking about that right now. But I do want to say that one of the strategies that you have that we'll be discussing in this class is actually having a different CSS file for mobile versus for desktop. So if we find something that works really well for a desktop design but doesn't work so well in a mobile design, don't worry about it because we can always apply a different CSS file to the mobile page. All right? So keep that in the back of your mind, because some of the things that we're going to study next are typically mainly used on desktop sites when we start talking about absolute position and that sort of thing. That's, that's a technique that typically works well on a uh, desktop site, but doesn't work so well when viewed on a mobile device. But all is not lost because we can go and we can uh, take and, and apply just a second style sheet that looks good on a mobile device and get the best of both worlds. We could also try to write a style sheet that works well under both modes too. That's another strategy. There's a variety of strategies that you can take to make your mobile site look good. Sort of as a last resort, you have a totally separate mobile site. All right. Uh, might be eBay. Uh, some of them. <coughs> that if you're on a mobile device and you go to it, you'll notice that your website changes from eBay.com to M.eBay.com. I think eBay is one of them. Facebook does that. Yeah, a lot of them do. I think Amazon does it and so on. So that's kind of your three choices. You hit the jackpot and come up with one CSS that covers both desktop and mobile. You have the same HTML file but apply different CSS, or you have just a totally different site. And we'll talk about when you do both. But again, I don't want to get ahead of the game here. Uh, I do want to say, though, that if uh, as we are developing these, if we have something that looks good on a desktop but doesn't look so good on a mobile device, it doesn't mean that we can't use it because we can always apply a different style sheet. So here's where we left off. All right, not bad. Uh, the last thing I want to do in this is I want to make the links be oriented horizontally. All right? Now, whenever you're faced with a change that you want to make, 
you know, one of the first things you should ask yourself is, does this constitute an HTML change or does this constitute a CSS change? And the, the deciding criteria is, are you changing what the content is or are you changing the way it looks? This is a navigation, it's a list of links. We don't want to change that. It's still going to be a list of links. So we're not changing the content at all. We are, however, changing the way that it looks. We want to get rid of the dot next to it, the bullet point, and we want to make it to, to be oriented horizontally instead of vertically. All right, so we're, we're dealing strictly with appearance. So uh, that's how we'll deal with it. So let me go in here and edit the CSS file. And what I will say is, nav ul. What that means is a ul within the navigation system. All right. We're refining the selectors. Now, it's a little bit tough in this class because I talk about some stuff in lab and I can't recall if I talked about it in the, in the overall lecture or not. But remember, the first part of the CSS rule is a selector. It determines what gets this style rule. So in this case, not every UL on the page will get it. Only the ULs within the nav section. And what I want to do is list style type colon none. That removes a bullet point. So that gets rid of the bullet point next to it. And it only does that to the list that's in the nav section because I said nav ul. To sort of prove that to you, I'll put a list over here in the section, not in not in the uh, not in the uh, navigation. So if I put a list here. We'll just put some dummy items in it. This list still has the bullet points on it because it's not a UL within the nav. It's a UL within the section. Again, this is the whole thing of cascading style sheets. You can refine the selector to point to not every HTML element on the page, but you can point it to uh, the specific one that you uh, want. And one way that you can point it to the specific one is to use the main section it is in. So nav ul will only make uls within that. Now, the other thing we can do is we can, in the CSS, to make the li's be oriented horizontally, we can say nav li display um, uh, inline dash block. All right. Inline block is sort of a cross between inline and, and block obviously, as the name implies. Let me just change this to inline, start out. I'll put them right next to each other. So they're now inline, even though they're in LIs, LI is normally a block tag. What's a block tag? A block tag is a tag that stacks on top of its neighbors, underneath the previous block tag and above the next block tag. This made them inline, so it puts them side by side. Now, watch this. I'm going to put a border around it. All right, there's my border. I'm going to try to make these look like buttons, like little buttons that you click. 
So I'm going to say with eight percent, let's say. That didn't have any effect. What if we try pixels? That also didn't have any effect. Hmm. What's going on here? What's going on here is this. Certain attributes only exist for block tags. So we made this an inline tag. All right. If I change this to inline block, or, or if I change the, that from inline to block, there, I get the width. But if I make it inline, I don't get the width. So we have a little bit of a dilemma. If we make it inline, we can't control the width. If we make it block, we can control the width, but it's going to be stacked on top of each other. Fortunately, there is something called inline block, which sort of says, make it an inline tag, but be able to set the attributes that you normally can only set on a block tag. So width is something you can normally only set on a block tag. So if we make that inline block, then we get the best of both worlds. All right. Now, I'm going to go here and we talked about the differences between percentage and uh, pixels. Just to make my life easier this morning, because it's a Thursday and Thursday is the new Friday for me. Uh, we will go in and we'll make these uh, 600 pixels. Okay, there we go. And again, if we resize it, it moves it, but it doesn't change the width. Okay. Now, we can make these look more like buttons by doing a couple things. Number one, now that they're set, set, aside, set off in, in, with a border around it, we probably don't need the underline. All right? So how do we do that? Well, we can say, again, do we want to do that to all our links? Probably not. Let's go and put a link somewhere here. Probably want to leave that link alone. I want to leave that link alone. All right. But these links, we want to get rid of the the um, line. So I can go and again, I can I do that via the selector. And I can say nav A text decoration none. Yes. I've seen it sometimes where they'll put nav ul li. Is there any reason behind that, or is it? Uh, I mean, that that's that's also correct. Okay. Because nav a says any a within the nav. Of course, in our case, all our a's are within li's, which are in the ul. I guess it would matter if you had other links in your nav that weren't within an unordered list, gotcha. which probably not likely. But if you did, then then it would be relevant. So we got rid of the underline. Um, let's put some padding on these guys to, to make it look a little more like a button so it isn't quite as crowded. So I can say padding four pixels. 
and I'll do that. Remember, we spent a lot of time last time talking about the shortcut property that I could say padding top, padding right, padding bottom, padding, padding left, but I'm just saying padding because I want it the same in all directions. All right, that was less than it seemed. So let's go maybe 10 pixels. All right, looks a little better. Uh, let's give it a different color. Let's give it a color uh, a background color of a darker gray. Four 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 is the same as O four O four O four. By the way, well, it's kind of dark. I don't want it that dark. Let's do yeah, all threes. Also, going to put. makes it a little bit too big so I will reduce it to 5 50. pardon me yeah it is very hard to read I'll, I'll make the color white too so nav li and the link and I'll make the color white a little bit too wide. Uh, what I can do is I can trim that down a little bit and we'll maybe make the width um, of the LIs not 80 pixels but we'll try 70 pixels. There we go. All right. Now we can go and we can add a mouse over effect of it. And we can say, nav a colon hover, that's a pseudo class called, in other words, when the user hovers uh, over it, we can give it maybe a background of, We'll do a lighter color. So we'll do pound sign 777777. Seven, 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 seven. All right. Now, if you notice, the whole thing doesn't get it just that. I'm going to go and I'm going to move some of these things into the eye, into the link, I mean, instead of the, instead of the li. Because I want the whole link to be this. So let's see. Border one pixel with 70, padding five.
they look like little little buttons. All right. Um, the navigation set off because it looks different, but also based on the position of it. That's uh, I think uh, Jacob Nielsen uh, has uh, a famous uh, designer has uh, a rule called uh, Nielsen's Law, and it's something to the effect that people spend more time on other websites than your website. All right, which which makes sense, right? You know, I mean, almost any website that you look at, even Google. If you add up all the time I'm on every other website, it's probably more than I'm in, on Google or, or Facebook or Amazon or whatever. Now, what is the implication of that? The implication of that is there have evolved certain conventions on web pages. For example, if you just look at this, it should be obvious to almost anyone that's ever been on a website that that's a navigation. Because a lot of websites have their navigation like that. All right? So use the fact that there are conventions. All right? Uh, to make it easier for your users to know what they are. Just use some color coding, like in this case, to sort of tip them off. The fact that that text is a different color is a tip off that these things are different. But it should be pretty obvious that this is links. And if you don't believe me, go to websites in other languages. You might not be able to read a word of them, but you can get a sense of the structure of them just because they follow the conventions that every other website follows. All right, so it should be pretty obvious based by the position based by the fact of the colors of these, that uh, these are, uh, these are uh, the navigation links. All right, we could play with this forever, but we want to move on and discuss some other techniques. So we're ready to clone these to make our prototype. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to try to be especially certain that this, this, not so much this, but this is the way I want it to be. I don't care if the CSS isn't perfect. <coughs> Why? Because I'm only going to have one CSS file. So if I decide, well, those links are a little too dark, that's okay. All right? Um, not that big a deal. We can make the change in the one CSS and lighten them up. But if I change that I want, if I decide I want something different on the top in the banner, all right, after I've cloned it, I have one, two, three, four, five, six copies to worry about. And I'll have to go and add that into six different pages. So the idea is make sure that the common HTML is as accurate as you think it is and as complete as you think it is. All right. Um, and then so we're going to start cloning it. And so what I'm going to do is do this. And I'll do... Um, I'll just do three of them because we're only doing a prototype, right? Uh, I guess I could do all the pages, but I'm lazy today. We'll just do three. I'll do home, portrait, and nature. So let's look what the names of those are supposed to be. Index, portrait, nature. Good. Notice one thing, those of you that have done some HTML or CSS coding before. Because of HTML5 and the new sections that exist in HTML5, we don't have any classes or IDs in here. All right? That's really the big victory, all right, that you got from doing uh, from, from the from the new uh, tags that are in HTML5. All right. It used to be you had to create only divs for each main section. Now we have specific sections with specific tags, header, nav, section, footer, and we can write style rules for those. So we don't have to worry about classes. We don't have to worry about uh, IDs as often. Not saying that we're never going to use an ID or we're never going to use a, a class, but and those of you that aren't sure what we mean in the, few, in the subsequent examples, we'll see examples of, of specifically what I mean. But all of our CSS rules are just based on HTML tags for this particular prototype. Okay, so I'm going to go 
I'm going to close out of this. Actually, let me bring it up again. I'm going to go and make copies of these. So I'll copy this. I'll paste. I'll paste. I'll paste. And this one will be the home page. I didn't want to do that. So I'll rename it to index.html. I will go and edit this. And I, I don't want to edit these. Well, I keep editing them. I want to rename this to portrait. And I want to rename this to nature. Now, I could continue and do the other three if I wanted to, but in the interest of time, I won't. Now I can go and I can make each one of these custom to itself. So I'm going to go here and edit this guy, and I'm going to change the word template to home. And I'm, in the interest of time, ideally I wouldn't have Greek text here. All right? But I don't want to go and type the history of photography on the home page here. So I'm just going to put the words, change this to text for home page. So there's our home page. Let me edit portrait. Change that to portrait. And I'll put in here change to content for portrait page. So you see, we don't have to change the common area. We just change the parts of the page that are distinct for each. They're distinct for each uh, page. And then finally, nature. for our prototype. We bring this guy up. There we go. Got a portrait. It's our portrait page, nature. There's our nature page, home. That's our home page. These, of course, won't work because we haven't done those yet. All right. Now, here's something cool that we can do. All right. Uh, this is a simple website. There's, there's six pages only. And users shouldn't get too confused on this site. But it's always valuable if you can give them visual cues of where they are in the site, where they are in the navigation. That's why a lot of sites have what are called breadcrumbs. Breadcrumbs sort of show you the path of how you got there. Like if you're, on, <clears throat> if you're looking at men's soccer shoes out of sporting goods, of how you got there, all right? Well, in this case, we only have six pages, so there's not a complicated path. But we might want to visually show the page that we're on a little bit differently, all right? 
So maybe what we can do is we can make the link look different for the page that we're currently on. Okay? So, let's do this. Let's go into index to start out. Now, this, and let's open up the CSS file as well. I'm going to put on index, you could either use a class or an ID, but I'm going to use an ID. All right. What is the difference between a class and ID? All right. The difference between a class and ID is they're both attributes that you can put on tags. So to put an ID on a tag, you say ID equals, and we've seen this before, right, when we did our internal links. So I can say ID equals current page. All right. When you use an ID, an ID identifies something, right? How many students have the same student number as you? No other students do, right? Your student ID looks like no one else's student ID. It couldn't work if your ID number was the same as someone else's, right? Because if you enrolled for a class, who is taking a class? You or the other person? Who gets the grade? Who gets the bills? <laughs> All right? You, there'd be that ambiguity there. So an ID, and like an ID number, like your student number is, has to be unique. And by unique, it means that there's only one. All right? Only one. That's why it always bugs me when they say, uh, LeBron James has the unique ability to hit free throws in a high-pressure situation or something like that. Because if they really meant unique, that would mean he was the only person in the world that could do it. Right? And strictly speaking, that probably isn't true. So, therefore, that's like a misuse, you know. Uh, but anyhow, I digress. Um, so, we give that an ID. And that ID is current page. I'm going to go in my style sheet. And I'm going to put a different style for the ID of current page. Now, you should remember from before that when we refer to ID some of the times, not when we put it as an attribute, but when we refer, we refer to it elsewhere, we put the pound in front of it. So I can say pound sign current page, and I can give it its own style rule. So I'll give it a background color of, of what? White and a color of black. Sounds good to me. So now we save both of these and look at them. We can tell at a glance, that the user can tell at a glance that they're on the home page. All right. But what about all the other pages? Well, you have to go in and manually put the ID on the link that relates to that page. So if we went to nature and portrait, we would on the respective pages would tag each of those with the ID. So the portrait page, this is the current page. And on the nature page, this is the current page. <coughs> so now if I save everything and go back and look at it, when I'm on the home page, that is there. When I'm on a portrait page, when I'm on a nature page, that is there. And we'd continue that for the other pages as well, if we did that. All right. So now, if we decide to change something in the CSS, it's not a lot we need to do, right? We just change it into one place. Um, so let's put a background tile behind this. All right. Let's go in and... CSS. Uh, 
process background tile. you could use that to make these tiles and it is a way to keep me amused for hours all right I'm just saying I'm not ashamed of that either it's, it's brilliant all right so let's save this image I'll put it in the folder it's called ghost tile it's put in there I am going to Simply put a reference in my CSS file that I'm using that, where I used it from. How do you put comments in your CSS file? That's a darn good question. Similar to like what use comments for in other uh, programming languages. So I can say uh, background colon URL ghost tile that JPEG I think it was. The point of this being that I only need to change it in one place. And so I'm less concerned about I'm less concerned about getting the CSS exactly right because I only have to change it in one place to make it work. Alright. The HTML for the common areas, there's a header and the footer. Uh, I would want to make sure that that's correct. Because if I decide now there's something else I'd want to put in the footer, I have to go back and put it on three different pages. Later on when you learn some server-side scripting, uh, we will learn alternate ways of doing that. All right. Not, when I say later on, I don't mean in this course. I mean in other courses. All right. So this is version one of our prototype. All right. We're now going to go through... Uh, a little bit quicker, uh, but still exploring other CSS things to create other versions of our prototype. First thing we're going to do is we're going to create a version of the prototype with, how do I want to do this? Um, We'll do it with uh, absolute positioning. All right. There's a couple ways we could go from here, but we'll do it with absolute positioning. Now, what is absolute positioning? Absolute positioning is where you specify the top and the left, or the bottom and right. All right. You can do it either way, but I almost always use top and left. All right. You specify the position using top, left, bottom, right of the elements of the page. And it reminds me of when I was in high school, all right, and I was on the school paper. Because we arranged things, what we did is we had big sheets of paper, the size of the 
that the newspaper was going to be printed. And someone would type on a typewriter, all right, uh, the, the articles. We had little, like, rubbings that we would rub the headlines, all right, and we'd put it on this paper and we'd send it off to the printer. The printer took a picture of it and then printed over and over again. But how we laid it out was like this. We would have a big sheet of paper and we would glue something right here. And we glued it down. So it didn't float around the page, it was stuck there. All right? Then we might glue another article here. We might glue a picture here. Another article here. Another picture here. All right. We glued them down at a specific position on the page. That is a specific distance from the top and from the left. For each of these things, it was a specific distance from the top, a specific distance from the left. And that's what we're going to do with our web page. We're going to focus on positioning the main blocks of the page. One thing that often happens to people when they start learning CSS, especially people that are sharp, all right, is they start to micromanage the CSS. And they start to go in and put all kinds of stuff in there to control every little detail. Well, remember, the default in CSS is sort of the flow pattern. So if you don't style something specifically, it's going to sort of fall into a flow. And a lot of times that flow is exactly what you want. All right? So don't necessarily worry about positioning everything on the page. Focus on the big things first. Yes? Um, is the absolute position similar to like the fixed position? No, fix is different than absolute. Okay. All right, we'll talk about fix probably on Tuesday. Okay. So what we're going to do, the template that we're going to try to, to make, the wireframe we're going to try to make, would be one where... page is going to look like this. We have our banner, our nav, which is going to be oriented vertically, our content, and our footer. Now here's the good news. If we really did a good job, we're only dealing with CSS now. We probably shouldn't have to make any HTML changes. Knock on wood. All right. So let's go and let's try that. Let's try to achieve this layout, a version of our page with this layout. So I'm going to go in. And here's our prototype. I'm going to call it prototype 1. I'm going to copy prototype one and call it, are you ready for this? Prototype two. So what am I going to do? I'm going to start out and get rid of everything in the CSS file. So now if I look at the page, no CSS to it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start adding bad things back in, and I'm going to add positions for particular things. So I'm going to go into my CSS, and I'm going to say, the banner. Position absolute. T 
top 10 pixels, left 10 pixels, width 600 pixels. Alright, so I go and do that. And I look at this, and there we go. All right, doesn't look really drastically different than what it did before. Let me put a border around it just to, so we can see exactly what it is. Border two pixels, solid red. Let's change from our monochromatic grayscale to little brighter colors. Okay. Yeah, it's called header. No wonder it didn't change it before. There we go. Good. That's what I wanted. I wonder why there wasn't an overlap before. All right. And I just kind of just blew right past it. Notice now the nav and the in the in the in the header, all right, overlap each other. Here's how CSS works. Everything you don't put a position on works in the flow. So how's the flow go? Goes first one, second one, third one, fourth one. Everything you do put a position on gets that position. So I put a position on banner, but I did not put a position on the navigation. So the banner gets the position I gave it, which is 10 from the top, 10 from the left. The navigation doesn't have a position, so it just goes with the flow. And therefore, it's going to be over top that. So kind of the lesson here is, is we got to give all these guys positions now. We've got to give all the major sections positions, because if we don't, they're going to be on top of the page. So if we give position of the nav, but not the section and the footer, that's going to overlap. If we give you know, and so on. So let's go, and let's just rough this one out and uh, come up with uh, a basic layout, and then we'll refine it on Tuesday. So I'm going to go with nav, and I'm going to say position absolute. Yes, and we'll, we'll take a look at that, what, what it means in a second. Especially, and we'll, we'll take another look at it when we compare it with fixed, because fixed is a little bit different than absolute. Top, maybe 120 pixels. Left, 10 pixels. Width. 100 pixels, and for good measure, I'll put a border on it just so that we can see things. I might take this border off later. That's something that I often do when I'm developing something is I'll even, even if I don't want to change the color of it or give it a border, I'll do it temporarily. So now, as predicted, that's there, but the section and the other thing went up. Looks like 120 isn't quite enough, so I will make it 150. And then I will give the section and footer just some quick things just so that we can wrap this up today because we're going a little over time. Again, giving you more than your money's worth.
too horrible. Let's just do a couple adjustments. All right, there we go. Approximately having it the way we want to. We just have to tweak it a little bit and so on. Now, what do we mean by absolute? By absolute, it is tied to the top corner of the browser, of the web page, not the browser window. So in other words, if I go, doesn't matter how big I make it, doesn't matter if I move it around, how small I make it, or how short I make it, it doesn't move. If I scroll though, it scrolls and the top it scrolls with the top of the page, not the top of the window. Alright? So as I scroll, it goes up. Alright? So fixed when we study that next week is a little different than that. Fixed is also sort of nailed down, but it's nailed down with relation to the window, not to the page, if that makes any sense. Okay, so uh, we'll go over and we'll make this one look a little bit prettier too, and we'll learn some techniques, and then we'll go on to other ways of doing a prototype. I will go and unlock the room, then I will come back and grab my files, then